Well, yes, um, once again, uh, thank you very much. Um, as uh, Theon said, my name is Sam Cook, and I run a business in Bilth Wales called Tremio, or Tremio Aero Photography, where we operate drones on a commercial basis and have done for the last five years. Um, the agenda for this evening, um, whilst keeping it in mind, is we are quite restrained by time. So I will go through as many points as I can. Um, we have only got 45 minutes, unfortunately. So what I'm going to ask, if you don't mind, is although you can put your questions in during, I'll try and answer all the questions at the end, if that's all right. Uh, but of course, if you have any questions that were nagging you and you didn't quite uh, remember to ask during the course, uh, my details will be at the end of the course, as well as obviously uh, Andrew Farm Connect, uh, Klinos, and everybody else's. So happy to help where we can. Um, so the agenda this, this evening uh, is a few things. Uh, just the drone basics. Uh, what is a drone? How do we use a drone? Uh, what's the purpose of a drone? Are they safe? Are they dangerous? Are they going to take over the world? The different flight modes of your standard drones. What can you use the drone for? Um, what are some of the functions of that drone? Some weather considerations, quite a key aspect, especially living in mid Wales or in Wales in general. Uh, we don't live in the Maldives and therefore we have to try and appreciate and respect the weather. Um, so I'm just got a question there, that's fine. Okay. We're going to talk a bit more specifically about the use of drones in agriculture. Um, we'll talk about some of the uses, um, some of the functions and also some of the restrictions and where we can't use them, where sometimes maybe we think we can. An overview of the regulations and laws. Regulations and laws you can talk about for hours and hours and I'll talk about the PFCO, which we'll talk a little bit later and that sort of joins in with the regulations and laws. No fly zones. Where can we fly? Where can't we fly? Um, are you concerned that you're gonna, where you're going to fly? It's going to be through a military fly pass and you're going to be avoiding those Chinooks and low flying planes. The drone code, a simple code implemented by the Civil Aviation Authority on how to fly your drone safely. Uh, PFCO, as I said, we'll talk a little bit about that. That's fundamentally the license. Now I use the term license very loosely. It's not a license. It's actually a permission from the CAA to be able to operate drones for a commercial game or venture. Um, insurance, what if you had that fly away? So you had the drone, you send it up and it went off into the long void and never to be seen again. Can you get insurance uh, just as a recreational user or not? And the future drones, where do we see them happening? Okay, okay to begin with, what is a drone? Well, when we use the term drone, we actually are referring to a UAV or an unmanned aerial vehicle. We will get drones in all sorts of different shapes and sizes and also cost implications. I'm sure somebody or maybe one of you have had a drone for Christmas or your children have. We've handed one. I certainly have given my five-year-old a drone, uh, quality Argos 20 pound one, uh, but in essence it's still a drone or a UAV, an unmanned aerial vehicle. The drone that you see there is actually the Mavic Pro, one of the standard drones, fold-away drones, um, averaging going to cost about £500. Now this is the kind of drone that you would get and one that I would personally recommend, I'd actually recommend the next level, which is the Mavic Pro 2, uh, which is probably ranging about £1,000. If you were really starting to get a bit serious about drones, that you were that one step ahead of just the toys um, or something you were concerned about, the first gust of wind flying away. Um, these drones are fantastic, great camera, about 30 minutes battery power. Um, also, they're fold away, uh, very difficult to show you normally within the, the classroom session. Um, I would show you, but here, unfortunately, I can't. But the arms and the props fold away to be a very small case, probably the size of a large mobile phone. Um, so you can pack that into your pocket and take off. Um, what we have here is the military Reaper drone, something on slightly on a different other scale. But what I'm trying to show here is when we refer to the term drone or UAV, we are actually referring to various different sizes or shapes and sizes. Again, although this is, uh, this is actually the SpaceX launch landing pad, but what I can actually do, if I bear with me two seconds, I can actually, um, can I do that 
that's that's fine. Okay, so the landing pad that's actually underneath the rocket, that is actually deemed as a drone uh, because it is deemed not as an unmanned aerial vehicle, but it's still as deemed as a drone. And then we have this, so just the Phantom. Now this is maybe one of the drones that you're quite sort of familiar seeing with. This is the kind of drone that I use on a day-to-day -day basis uh, for functionality and ease of use, um, plus the camera is excellent. Um, producing still photography as well as videography. Again, this is the range, this is the Phantom 4 Pro, which you can range in probably about six to 700 pound now. So these are all the terms we get for drones, uh, the different variants you can get in. The two main brand leaders is a company called DJI. Now DJI is a Chinese brand. They own about 70% of the market of drones. Uh, the company is in excess of $16 billion. Uh, huge company. The Phantom you see there and the grey, the Mavic one, the first photo, are DJI products. Uh, the reason that they sell so well and they are market leaders is purely because they are uh, they produce very, very good drones. Um, we refer to them as almost the apple of the drone world. Uh, they produce these drones straight out of the box. You can fly them um, for almost prosumer and sort of recreational users. Uh, very easy uh, user interface on your phone or your tablet, and you're good to go. So very, very good drones. All my drones are DJI. Um, I know them well. And the sort of next market leader is a company called Unique. Um, very big company, but still uh, not my liking. I guess you can refer it or relate it to the sort of Android versus Apple sort of debacle. But uh, yeah, so those are the two market leaders. So as I said, so UAV, unmanned aerial vehicle, or drone. So when we're talking about these and talking about the different shapes and sizes, when we're specifically talking about the UAV, you can get these different variants. So the one at the top is the, the top left is the yellow uh, helicopter. So it's standard RC helicopter. Now this was a bit more of the yesteryear um, where you used to attach a great big whopping camera to a petrol powered RC helicopter, or if it wasn't connected to a standard helicopter anyway. Um, these things are much more put towards um, sort of the model flying hobbyists now. We don't tend to use these within a commercial sector. Uh, one, uh, the weight, the, the danger risks um, of using a petrol RC, um, and it's just a lot easier now with the technology of lithium ion batteries, it's a lot easier to use standard, just normal drones, battery powered drones. The next one to the right, the plain looking one, um, is what we call fixed wing drone. Now fixed wing drones are fantastic in a certain sector. They're used a lot within say the agricultural or mapping sector. The reason for that is because they're very lightweight, you can have a considerably longer time in the air. They're also modular. So if that thing was to come down and the likelihood is one of the wings would fall off, which can be very easily replaced. Uh, the next drone, which is the bottom left, which is the Inspire, if that thing came out of the sky and crashed, there are a lot more things to break and snap and tends to be a lot more expensive. Uh, again, going back to the fixed wing, uh, these things tend to be used for mapping. So what would happen is it can cover a great di uh, distance, a huge distance compared to some of the fixed wing drones, uh, sorry, uh, to the multi-cops drones. Um, so yeah, people tend to use them to uh, map properties, land, uh, and survey work as well. The next one we have is the Inspire, which is that grey and black looking thing. So that would be a drone, what you, you definitely use within a professional sector. The camera at the bottom is interchangeable, so you can attach different lenses, different um, modules to it. Um, those can average at about, you're starting just for the drone itself, you're probably looking at about three, possibly four thousand pounds. And then with a the camera on top of that, you're probably looking at an extra two thousand pounds on top of that. So they can be very expensive, but they're very, very good. Um, they will be used within the movie and TV sector, as well as inspection, roof inspection, things like that. Uh, they all have dual battery capacity. So although they have two batteries, you'll still only be looking at about 25 minutes flight time, uh, maybe a little longer depending on how you fly. Um, but also if one battery went, then it turns it over to the next one. 
And then the next one is a little bit of a, a rarity. It's what we call the hybrid. So it's the best of both worlds, where it's best of a fixed wing as well as that multi-copter drone. So what it can do is it can cover the distance of those fixed wing planes, but when it comes to a point where it'd like to focus on, the propellers could take over and it then in turn becomes a multi-rotor copter where it can stay in its one place. So you can get different variants, um, all shapes and sizes again, uh, but the ones that we tend to be looking at here are, sorry, the ones we tend to be looking at will be the gray DJI Inspires. It, again, it's a DJI product, um, comes straight out of the box, fly it straight away, fantastic bits of kit. So the flight modes. Now, when I'm talking about the flight modes, I'm talking about predominantly DJI, sorry, DJI products. So these are the products, as I said, I'm familiar with, but it's also the products you're more than likely going to be buying if you're gonna be buying a drone. If you type in drone, it's gonna be the first one to come up with. So I thought I'd implement it. The first one, like any good drone over a sort of 150 pound mark, will have GPS built in. The purpose of GPS uh, for a multitude of reasons. Um, one, we will talk about fail safes, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, but it's also used for um, uh, monitoring as well. So as commercial drone operators, we need to ensure that we are flying safely and within fly zones um, that are deemed safe and that are deemed as a non-fly zone. And to prove this to the CAA, we can have GPS tracking. Um, it's also used in case of emergencies or flyaways. So if your drone did fly away, then the GPS location will be able to tell you exactly where it is. Um, and for lots of other sort of reasons, um, a reason I use GPS predominantly is for roof inspections. So I work with insurance companies where we will go out to site uh, properties and we will photograph and record footage of um, storm damaged roofs. Now to get that footage, I need to ensure that my drone is gonna be as stable as possible. I don't want it just flying away in the wind. So that's when GPS comes into play, that those GPS satellites will fix that drone into place and it does a very, very good job. ATI, so ATI or attitude mode is a simple mode that can be turned straight onto the controller. Now this basically disables the GPS. So it is free with the wind. Uh, the reason that a lot of people like to use ATI, especially in the commercial sector, is because if you start becoming comfortable with uh, flying a drone that's in ATI, GPS will become a, a lot easier. Um, we also use it in a cinematography world. So instead of trying to control the drone and getting a lovely sweeping shot of a field or, or coming on into the beach um, where there might be some strong winds, the thing with GPS, it will constantly try and fight you or help you. Uh, where it'll, in ATI mode, if you just pop in ATI mode, let the drone go with the wind in the direction that you'd like to go, hit record, you'll get that lovely smooth shots. So it can be very, very handy. And the last but no means least is sports mode. Sports mode uh, allows the drone to go up to about 35 miles an hour. Um, the problem with sports mode, well, there's various problems with it. Uh, one, going at that speed, it's very rare that you're gonna be able to capture anything. So it's just gonna be a blur of colors and you won't be able, the, the viewer won't be able to gauge what it is. And also it'll deplete the batteries like no one's business. The Phantom and, well certainly the Phantom, I will get about 20 minutes of flight. And that is if I'm not fighting it. So as you can imagine, I need every bit of juice from the batteries as possible. Um, so for me personally, sports mode has never really been of any use. Uh, payloads and gimbals. So simply put, the payload and gimbal is what the drone carries and what it's able, able to carry. Uh, why is this important is because the more and more the technology advances with the drones, the more and more uh, that they're becoming modular where you can attach different attachments to the drone, different cameras um, and different tools for a better of a term. The one you're seeing there is a hexcopter. Oh, it's an octocopter, really. Um, now, these are the kind of things that you're going to be seeing much more within the cinematography world. So you'll be seeing your Netflix documentaries and your Discovery and your David Attenborough's being filmed with these kind of drones. 
Um, the reason for it is that the camera below that is a magic or not a red camera, that's right, the iRed camera, um, which are talking 20, 30,000 pounds worth of camera, huge expense. So they use these drones because one, it's got the battery power and the lift capacity. It's got those dual uh, propeller systems uh, for redundancy. So if one of those props was to break and shatter in midair, then at least you've got some redundancy and to bring the drone back, it'll still remain in flight. The problem is if you have just a quadcopter, just with your four props, and one of the props broke, then it's only gonna do one thing, that's gonna come hurtling to the ground. So yeah. Uh, this next one shows a company based in Scotland who are using drones for the purpose of LiDAR or laser technology, which is what that red and white device is underneath the drone. Um, they're actually using this, as I said, in Scotland, where they are monitoring the canopy of forests. And by flying over the forest and using this laser technology, they're actually able to detect what's underneath the canopy of the forest and see what damage or no damage that's been caused there, whether it be man-made um, or natural. Uh, the, obviously, the advantage of this is pretty obvious. The fact that you don't have to have man people, sorry, um, walking through the forests, um, increasing the risk of health and safety problems, as well as um, just manpower, where instead you can get these guys who can turn up on site and take that drone and acquire the data that is needed uh, very quickly at a fraction of the cost of getting people to do it. This is another DJI product, and uh, something we'll talk a little bit about. This is the Zenmos XT, which is actually a thermal camera. So again, this is the kind of camera that can be attached to that Inspire 2. Um, it's just to highlight the, as I said, the uh, functionality of these drones and what you just simply attach to them. And just on a maybe sort of side note, I use it somewhat in jest, but again, it shows what it's actually capable of. So this is um, a system that they're actually using in China where we've got these high rise cables and where rubbish lands up on these cables. And just to highlight that. This is the way that they deal with this cable, uh, with this rubbish, sorry. So as you can see, incredibly dangerous. Um, I don't think you'll be able to get away with this in this country with the Civil Aviation Authority and knowing the way that they are. Um, but again, it just shows you as well the functionality and what's actually possible with these drones. So talking a little bit about GPS before, um, I'm going to talk about fail safes. Now, what do we mean by fail safe? It's, it's quite self-explanatory that if you had an emergency situation within the drone um, or what, whilst flying the drone, uh, what functions are there that will bring the drone back safely or land safely? Uh, why do we have them to what threat? Why do we have to have them on commercially operated aircraft? Now, as commercial drone operators, and certainly any drone commercial operator worth their salt, will put safety at first before anything else. Um, they won't be afraid to tell a customer, no, I'm not going to make that flight because I deem it as unsafe. Um, so we have these fail safes uh, that will help us get out of a situation if we deem something as being dangerous. Um, as I said, safety is always first with us. Now, the DJI fail safes um, are come in abundance. So, one is a collision avoidance. So, on the Phantom, which is that white drone that I showed you, um, we actually have uh, sensors on the front and the back. So, what will happen is when the drone is flying, if it detects something within a five feet distance, it will actually stop. The drone will stop dead in its path um, if you're flying forward or backwards. Now, the new Mavic Pro 2, which is that sort of grey flat one that I said that could fold away, the one that I recommend highly, uh, that actually has omnidirectional sensors. So it has sensors on the top, on the bottom, and on the sides. So if you're flying up and it detects maybe an um, overhanging tree branch, it will actually stop there and then. Fantastic systems. can work a bit too well sometimes, um, especially when I'm trying to capture, as I said, a roof inspection, and I want to get that a little bit closer, but I know I'm fully... Um, I'm fully safe and everything's under point control and the sensors will pick up but what you can do is you can actually disable all those sensors so um, you can turn them off as, as and when. 
The geofencing is um, a very important factor. So what will happen is if, for example, I wish to take photos of the Queen at Buckingham Palace, then if I was to go to Buckingham Palace and try and take off, now because of that geofenced area at Buckingham Palace using the GPS signal, then the drone will simply not take off. It just will say, look, you're in a no-fly zone in a geofence area, then you, we're not happening. So I think, well, okay, in that uh, case, I'm gonna head off maybe a mile out, knowing that's the GFS bubble. I will take off and then I'll fly over to Buckingham Palace. So what will happen in that case is the drone will take off, it will fly, but once it detects that no-fly zone bubble, the drone will actually turn around and fly back. It'll actually, the return to home function will kick in and it'll return and land Certainly with the new Mavics within a foot or so, I think uh, as far as the manual is concerned, I think it's about two or three square meters. But to be fair, every time I've used it, it's always happened uh, within a foot. Um, so it actually returns to that safe spot. Um, something else as far as the failsafe is concerned is if I'm flying my drone and for some reason I'm just not happy, uh, whether it be the wind might be picking up, it's a little bit too strong, um, I may be detecting some mechanical failure, then what I can do is I can hit that return to home. Another way of doing, using it is the visual line of sight. So say for some reason I've lost the visual line of sight of that drone, then what I can do is I can hit that return to home, then that drone will elevate to 30 meters, then it will slowly fly back over to you and it will land exactly where you took off. Um, now, that's fantastic, but also it's something that you need to work with. Don't just hit it and then walk away and think, well, that's me done, I'm going to have my cup of tea. The idea of it is to bring it back within a safe distance and then you can regain control of that drone and land it safely. So with all these fail safes, fantastic, but uh, don't just rely on it, it's just technology as well. So just to summarize, drones are a diverse species, but when we talk about drones, we're normally talking about UAVs or unmanned aerial vehicles. The payload is what a UAV or drone is carrying and gimbal acts as a stabilizer for the camera. And aware of the three flight modes associated with DJI drones and the difference between them. Um, sorry, yeah, talk about the payload and the, the gimbal. Uh, the gimbal is the system or mechanism uh, that stabilizes and controls the camera or where the camera is looking. Um, any drone, again, over the sort of 100 pound mark um, will have a relatively good gimbal and uh, whether it be digital or mechanical and where it will stabilize, especially you know, if you're trying to get some lovely shots and the wind is strong, then that gimbal is really going to come into play. Okay, so weather considerations. One that we're obviously going to be very familiar with is our good friend rain. Now, when it comes to rain, obviously most drones do not protect the electronics from water ingress, meaning if I was to fly a drone, then the risk is always going to be there that a simple drop is going to enter the, the, uh, the mechanics, cut the, uh, short the, the circuits, and the drone will fall out of the sky. Um, it's an obvious one, but it's something that people will always try and push. Now, I have been in a situation where I've had to, not had to, I've returned the drone or flown the drone um, in the rain uh, when I was working up at the Elam Valley. Um, the rain hit us completely out of nowhere and I had to return. Um, but it was also a point where I was recording this, uh, it was a 120 car rally and it was only gonna happen once. This drive-by was only gonna happen once. So I had to get the shots. Now the reason I took the risk of flying in the rain was because if the drone was to completely cut out and fall, the only place it was going to fall was gonna be into the reservoir. And therefore the only person that was gonna be upset was going to be me and probably my wife who deals with the accounts because we have to buy a new drone. But that's why I took that risk. I would always suggest to people, do not fly in the rain. Uh, I know it's an obvious thing, but some people will try and push it. You know, you might see that technically uh, the, the propellers are going so quickly that they will deflect, um, that they will deflect the rain and you can fly, but I just suggest you don't. Um, transmitter signal issues uh, with thick rain, uh, just like any interference between the controller and the drone itself, it can cause issues. And image quality, the biggest issue, well, maybe not the biggest, but one of, one of the biggest issues is actually uh, you've got your drone up there, you're about to take a photo, and you're thinking, well, okay, if the drone 
you know, uh, falls out of the sky, then I'm above the field, it's fine. But one of the things is uh, you get a single drop of rain on that camera lens, then your entire shot is ruined, you know, whether it be photo or video. So, you know, my thing is there's no point flying in the rain. However, we are sort of progressing in technology as far as waterproofing drones. Um, this is actually a submergible drone, which is actually can go straight underwater, can actually operate underwater and then fly out, uh, which is very, very cool. Uh, but again, it's very much a niche thing. You, why you would want this commercially, I, I never know, but uh, it is showing progress. Or this, so like the Phantom drones that I was saying, you can actually buy third party wetsuits <laughs> for, for more of a technical term. Um, you basically get ringlets that can cover the uh, motor openings and also the, the actual covers themselves. But again, these are third party products where, you know, it, one, your insurance company will still not be covered. So if you got contact your insurance, say, look, my drone fell out of the sky because I was flying in the rain, um, but I was wearing my drone wetsuit, um, then it, you know, it won't, it won't fly quite literally, <laughs> figuratively. Um, but, you know, as I said, there are sort of, I say ways around it, but I don't want to really use that term. But my advice, do not fly in the rain. Sun. So again, uh, living in mid Wales, although we are looking out the window now, we're seeing a little bit of sun. Um, but, you know, there, there are going to be times when you're going to be flying in sunlight, believe it or not. Some of the things to be aware of, and as silly as they sound, um, are sunburns. When you're flying that drone, remember you're sat there looking up at your drone for 15, 20 minutes at a time, and then you return it, put a battery in, go back up again. You're going to be constantly in that sunlight. Please ensure that you are taking the right precautions. Also, some of the issues with flying in the sun is with photogrammetry. So with drones that you use to do 3D mapping, or where you're stitching photos together, meaning if I, uh, there is a function on a lot of the newer drones um, where you can take a panoramic shot. So what will happen is the drone will remain in one stationary position, and from there, it will take 21 photos of varying different angles. So it will go left, take a photo, left even further, take a photo, left even further, take a photo, right, and basically put all these photos together. Then with the software, it's able to stitch all those photos together. Um, and 21 is just by default, you can change it. Um, so that's great, uh, as long as you've got a clear photo where the, the technology, the software is able to stitch these photos together automatically. If you've got a sun with very strong shadows and causing different lines, it does tend to confuse it. So it does make it a little bit more difficult. Um, some things that you can overcome, um, just like anyone who knows anything about photo, uh, photography, uh, you can't take a photo of the sun directly, but what you can do to help is obtain these um, essentially sunglasses for your drone, what we call ND filters, new density filters. Um, they can be varying in price from Amazon from 15, 20 quid all the way up to two, 300 pound. So you can get very different qualities of it. Another issue which drone operators will encounter is actually being able to see your iPad or phone um, when operating from the controller. So what you can do, we can get these uh, covers, which are fantastic, and they will act as, um, again, sort of a cover to make sure the sun doesn't shine off the back of it. Anyone who's tried using a mobile phone in the sun will, will know what I mean. Wind. So uh, the wind, the Phantom 4 Pro, again, we'll just use this as the example. Um, as far as the manual is concerned, it says it's a maximum of 22 miles per hour. Uh, the issue is not necessarily the land wind, but it tends to be the gusts. So what you can do is you can be sitting there going, well, I'm fine, I'm, I'm, you know, it's not too windy. But once you go above that hill cover, then that's when the gusts really will kick in. Uh, the software and the technology is clever enough that it will actually inform you if there are strong winds, just to be wary. And in some cases, if the wind does get too strong and it's causing too much problems, the return to home will kick in and it will actually return the drone back to you. Um, the problem with flying in wind is a couple of reasons. One, obviously, it does increase the danger. Um, also, it's going to be using your batteries um, considerably harder because especially in GPS, you're going to, it's going to be constantly trying to fight the wind. So if you're trying to go right against the wind, then it's going to be constantly fighting it. So it's just something to be wary of. Uh, although the Phantom 4 Pro does say 22 miles per hour, I have flown in winds a lot stronger than that. 
um, sort of down in Carmarthen. We just did a job down there and yeah, the winds were, were considerably stronger. Um, however, again, I knew it was completely in my control. If the drone was to fall out of the sky or if I had to do a crash landing, it would have been in the field in the middle of nowhere. Um, and again, I would have been the only one upset. Some things that we can do to say, predict the weather, but some obviously just using uh, forecasting tools. The one that I found uh, most useful and a lot of drone operators will preach is the UAV forecast, which is that green and pink table. Uh, basically, this is a free service um, for a two day forecast. Anything after that, you have to pay a subscription and you can either download it on your phone or just go onto the website. And what they do is they put in a very user-friendly format, what you're going to be looking at as far as gusts, um, visibility, and your KP, which is uh, your essentially your solar flares from a technical term, um, where it might cause interference between the transmitter and the drone itself. And it simply says, are you good to fly? But like all of this technology and these tools, use it with your common sense. There have been times when I've looked at this and it said, absolutely no problem, okay to fly. I've looked out the window myself and it's been horizontal rain. So please use this sensibly. So, uh, time check, okay. So the use of drones in the agricultural sector. Um, there are varying different factors um, or uses of drones, or when I say uses, I want to be very clear, possible uses of drones within the agriculture sector. So what I'm about to talk here, it is being implemented very, very slowly in other parts of the country, uh, sorry, in other parts of the world where it may work, but it's not necessarily able to work in this country or within certain factors of the agricultural sector um, for varying different reasons, whether it be our uh, um, weather systems or whether it be our simple legal parameters. One thing that gets thrown about a lot um, is the discussion of agricultural spraying. Now, this particular drone, again, is another DJI product. It's called the DJI MS-1S. Um, it's a huge drone um, that is, I think it's about three meters by three meters square. Um, it costs around excess of 5,000 pounds. Now, it is used um, quite a lot and it's being pushed a lot within China, funnily enough, as a Chinese company. Um, to operate and being used within spraying of, <coughs> excuse me, spraying the crops. As I said, it's, well, it's, it's, a, it's a very large drone. So we're not talking about a drone that you simply will keep on the back of the quad and where you can use uh, 20 kilograms within excess. And it contained within 10 liters of solution. Uh, what it does is it uses GPS signaling that it will always remain a maximum of five meter height and it will map or you map uh, the layout that you want the spraying to commence. So what you do is before you do it once, you would simply using a GPS signal, you would map out where you wish the drone to go, and then it will follow that route every single time um, within a very, very small um, failure accuracy. Um, they're also implementing a technology where it does a completely automated system. So this drone will be housed in a uh, technical term, a shed uh, with an opening roof. And then when the spraying needs to happen, obviously this is all input by the farmer or landowner. Uh, the roof shed will open, the drone will leave itself, commence with the spraying and then land and back into a charging station. Um, this is all very very cool and <laughs> it sounds very good but having spoken a lot about this agriculture spraying to landowners and to people who do spraying themselves there's a lot of issues as well and that's why I keep saying about this possible use of drones within the sector. Um, having said that some of the, the, the pros are possibly where it can be used is obviously the zero ground compaction so where you haven't got a tractor or you haven't got people trotting through the, the crops you've got this drone going across um, being able to spray taller crops, such as maize, um, access to difficult terrain. Um, basically what would happen, this drone will remain at its five meter height, no matter which hill um, or, or piece of land it can go up. So as it's going up this hill, then it will remain at that five meters and adjust accordingly to spray correctly. Uh, spraying under or around power line pylons um, and spot spraying, which is obviously a key point. Instead of getting the tractor out, you can simply take this drone out 
and uh, do the spot spraying instead of investing in all that time taking the or however you would do it. Um, the issue that I have heard, and again, a lot of this time it's a shame that I, in a classroom session with this, I would turn it actually around to yourselves where I would get the discussion of, you know, the pros and cons from the people who actually do it. Um, I don't do spraying, so I, you know, it's always good to hear that feedback. A lot of the feedback is actually the legalities of it as well. Um, I understand that there's different licensing when it comes to spraying um, and different um, categories, I think it's all licenses. Um, and the problem with the UK government trying to implement this is it doesn't fall under any particular category. It still doesn't fall under aerial because um, it's not a plane. It doesn't do it at that level, um, but it doesn't fall under the uh, it happening via just a human being um, or on the tractor. So it's a very difficult one for them to do. So yeah, quite a difficult one. Um, I'm just being aware of time. So sorry, I will sort of speed up a little bit so please bear with me. Uh, the livestock monitoring, um, so the thermal cameras which I was talking previously about um, on the other drone um, are being implemented into or possibly being implemented into various sectors of the agricultural sector. Um, what, so I'll pop one for there. So this drone in particular is the DJI Mavic 2 Enterprise. So again it has that functionality where you're able to fold away the arms and with it all folded away, it's the size of a notebook. So very, very small, can be put in a bag with the controller as well. Now, the advantage of this drone is it does have thermal capability. Now, thermal capability is a science all to itself. So although it's great just to pick up and go, if you really want to get into the nitty gritty, then there are particular courses to go on thermal courses to make sure that you know what you're doing properly. Um, a lot of the time that these drones can be used is for search and rescue. Um, a couple of winters ago, when we had that really bad snow, I was hearing stories of farmers using this drone um, by going on the quad, um, sending the drone up and actually being able to monitor and see where livestock are being lost in the snow. Um, obviously, as you can imagine, walking around within three foot snow is considerably more difficult than being able to just pull up on the quad on the side of the field and send the drone out and obviously that thermal will detect the heat markings of that animal um, saving a lot of time and, and um, risk factor. Um, also it's used for uh, security reasons um, spotting predators and spotting intruders. I hear stories of farmers using it, um, sending it out and trying to actually see where people tend to be breaking into the farm or trespassing things like that. So again, another possible use. And again, I'm very sort of strong on that possible use. Crop management and health. Um, again, this is a, a uh, quite a huge topic to be very sort of briefly discussing now. Um, a website, that's our website, a product called Drone Deploy is this fantastic piece of software that is used in conjunction with drones and drone data in obtaining very specific and scientific data um, of landowners fields and their crop management and various other factors it, it, there's, there's a multitude of reasons uh, to use it um, till hill um, who is a large forestry commission they are very keen on using it where they're able to detect um, forest and tree health uh, from a distance um, this is just a very quick example of um, farmer bread good good the pronunciation, um, identified areas of rust fungus in his wheat crop using Drone Deploy's plant health map. So what he basically did was took the drone up and used the software um, where it had this pre-built um, artificial intelligence into it where it's able to detect it. Um, drone Deploy, oh, oh big bump, sorry, that's me. Um, on the right hand side as well, Drone Deploy's built-in health uh, toolbox helps you highlight crop variants across the field to measure plant health. Again, where it's using that drone soft, um, using the drone and the software to, in conjunction, where it says you're actually able to detect the health of varying crops. Um, again, I'll, I'm happily sort of discuss this a little bit further. Um, maybe if you want to contact me afterwards, um, a company that's really produced uh, pushing this as well is um, uh, A2G drones or AG drones, big pardon. Um, where they're really implementing drones within the agriculture and sector in the UK specifically. Um, but again, I'm happy to discuss a lot more about this later. Um, crop management and health. So again, you go back to those thermal um, cameras. Um, here's an example of where it's actually able to detect any irrigation problems within the fields. Um, 
instead of sending somebody out, uh, you're able to actually use that thermal technology to actually detect it. Um, where in this case, uh, it's actually detecting uh, where it's receiving uh, too little or excessive moisture within the fields and where there may be pipe leaks. And certainly a bit more specific to the forestry sector, uh, drones actually being implemented with the planting of seeds in the, um, the growing of uh, forests. So what would happen, uh, this is an image to obviously represent it, this particular drone, this isn't the type of drone that you'd be able to get off the shelves. Um, having said that, all those other drones that I've mentioned before are drones that you can buy off the shelves. You can easily buy them. This one, not so much. Um, so this one actually goes out beforehand using LiDAR technology is able to detect uh, the perfect soil, the perfect route for uh, the planting of the seeds. Then it's actually able to map out its route. Then using that drone is actually able to shoot, from a technical term, uh, seeds into the ground on that exact route. Uh, and obviously everything is recorded and used for management. So it's a fantastic bit of kit, but again, possible in some areas, um, just not being implemented fully at the moment. But it just goes to show wh where we were hopefully going. Um, again, uh, not again, but this is one that kind of gets sniffed out by half people and then some people kind of go, oh, hang on a minute. Yeah, so uh, the livestock monitoring. Drones uh, used to herd livestock. Um, obviously, you can never replace the dog, uh, but can be used along with. This is actually being used quite a bit in New Zealand. Um, the DJI Mavic, which is that small fold-away drone one, uh, another variant of it, the Enterprise, it actually has a speaker attached to it. Now, as silly as this sounds, please bear with me, um, the speaker can be used uh, for, and I know some of the, um, during the whole lockdown, uh, lockdown time, <laughs> um, people were using it to basically monitor where people are trespassing and where people aren't going and then they would use the speaker to tell them to get back in the car and go away maybe not in such kind of words um, but as far as the livestock monitoring is concerned um the this is sorry that's an example of it uh, with actually the speaker on top and then just to kind of instead of me talking about it i'll just show you a video where it's actually being used to herd the sheep this one in particular is actually using the Phantom and I think they're using the Mavic so as you can see there it's actually being used to herd the sheep um, again some people kind of think oh that's actually quite a cool idea um, other people think well that'll never work um, I think the problem is there's been scientific uh, studies as far as drones and livestock and how they react to it it was a, a, an experiment done in, G in Germany and the cows just couldn't give a monkeys. They, they really couldn't um, care about the drone. Um, having said that, some uh, animals do react to it. In my experience, um, we've done a lot of uh, horse shows, things like that. And obviously within uh, farming, sort of where, whether it be uh, land inspection or promotion for sales, uh, promotional videos and photos, and um, sheep do react to it the most. Um, horses don't really care, cows don't, so maybe it's a size thing, I'm not sure. But again, something that maybe scoffed at, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, just to summarize, drones can operate in all types of weather as long as the operator is aware of the risks, that's the key thing. Um, all precautions have been taken to minimize risk to injury or damage. And drones can have a multitude of uses in the agricultural sector and um, uh, the, yeah, the agricultural, big pun in the agriculture sector, from livestock control, crop management and spraying, and management. Okay, so, so I'm just being somewhat cautious of the time. Um, just, so uh, this is a very, very short video, um, actually deemed as the drone code. Now the drone code was implemented by the Civil Aviation Authority um, to administer some rules, some very basic rules for anyone wanting to operate a drone. Now this is commercial or recreational. The UK Drone Code is published by the Civil Aviation Authority to assist drone users. Here are a few pointers to clear up any confusion and help you fly safely. Be drone safe. Always keep your drone in sight. This allows you to see and avoid other things while flying. Staying below 400 feet helps reduce the likelihood of a conflict with manned aircraft. Be drone aware. Every time you fly your drone, 
you must follow the manufacturer's instructions. If you do this, it will help you to keep your drone and the people around you safe. Be drone legal. When using your drone, legal responsibility lies with you. You are responsible for each flight. Stay well away from aircraft, airports and airfields, as it is a criminal offence to endanger the safety of an aircraft with your drone. Remember, don't fly near airports or airfields. Remember to stay below 400 feet. Observe your drone at all times. Never fly near aircraft. Enjoy responsibly. For further information, please Okay, so some of the key points that I wanted to bring up from there, from their drone. Um, one of them is the, remember to stay below 400 feet. So all drones, um, unless you have an OSC, which is an operational safety case, uh, you have to remain below the 120 meter mark. Uh, now, again, most drones worth their salt if, um, will actually have a limit, so you won't be able to fly above this even if you tried. Uh, there are obviously ways around it, and that's within breaking the technology and, 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 and hacking it, for a better term. Um, but of course, if you're that way inclined, then you're not sort of taking things responsibly anyway. Um, but yeah, so the key thing that uh, obviously never fly near an aircraft um, or a, uh, an airport. That's obviously quite a given. Uh, the rules at the moment, you have to remain five kilometers away from that, air, that airport. Um, and observe your drone at all times. Um, that's something we'll talk a little about in a little bit. Uh, oh, <laughs> such as this now. So the big part of uh, being a commercial drone operator is what we call VLOS, or visual line of sight, never beyond visual line of sight. Uh, this is a key thing that a lot of people say, well, I've got a drone, I'm gonna send it and miles away, and uh, there, that'll be done. Now, we must preach that you must always remain uh, within some form of visual line of sight of that drone. Um, because although you're able to see a camera feed on the camera, you don't know what's behind you, what's above you, what's behind, uh, what's below you. So always keep visual line of sight. Never fly in VOG for obvious reasons. Um, not only do you lose that visual line of sight, you will lose transmitter issues and it will cause all sorts of problems. The maximum distance horizontally is 500 meters. Um, so you will find if you ever to fly that sort of distance it's very difficult to keep that visual line of sight so if you need to get that further then you simply bring it back to you then you go closer to that point and fly um, so it isn't just a free fall that you can send it for miles and miles and miles away and the maximum height as I said is 120 meters or 400 feet 396 feet to be exact. Now the PFCO, the Permission to commercial, uh, for Commercial Operations. So what is a PFCO? A permission from the CAA is required to be held if you wish to conduct a commercial operation with your aircraft um, in accordance with the Air Navigation Order 2016, Article 945. Now this is all changing um, as of December of this year, but as for now, we are still deeming it as the PFCO, or Permission to Fly Commercial Operations. Why do you need it? If you were to use your drone for any commercial gain, now, what I mean by that is not just a suitcase full of money, <laughs> I wish it was a suitcase full of money, but if you are getting paid for the job, you'll need your PFCO, but also if you are operating a drone uh, for your work. Now, although you, you're not getting directly money, you are getting paid to operate that drone. Um, one that's always kind of a bit of a gray area is estate agents. Now, technically, they should be having a PFCO, um, but they don't always because they're not getting money necessarily, but they are doing it for commercial gain. So that's why you need a PFCO. How do you get a PFCO? Now, various different NQEs, which are the uh, organizations throughout the country that will operate, uh, that will deliver the courses. Um, one that I, I actually deliver the course myself as well, um, in conjunction with Global Drone Training um, in Bilf. And it's a two day theory course comprising of approximately four to five exams. Um, everything from meteorology to air navigation orders to air law um, to all sorts of bits pieces in between. So it's a really thorough course to ensure that you're flying a drone safely um, and just have the, that general knowledge. Um, they can, prices sort of vary. Um, up can be up to a thousand pounds, twelve hundred pounds, and then once you've done your theory, you then do your operational assessment, 
which is then your practical. So you need to show that you're able to fly a drone competently. Um, we, we do various different maneuvers and um, where you do emergency reactions. Uh, so you'll send the drone off to its furthest point. You will then switch the controller off and then you need to return the drone safely uh, by turning it on correctly and not, not panicking basically. The advantages is that, that you can make some money. Um, it's a very saturated market at the moment. However, um, people will still sort of start doing the courses and st start making a bit of a uh, bit of an income. Um, the advantage is that you can also have a restricted distances, so you can have up to 30 meters closer. I won't go into this too technical, but you can get away with a few more things distance-wise, getting closer to people out of your control. But again, that's a whole different story, uh, subject for a different day. Uh, PSO disadvantages is something that I wasn't sure if I should put on the here or not, but the disadvantages, it costs a lot of money to do the initial outlay. Once you've done your course, you have to pay for commercial insurance. You then have to pay for your renewal. Then you have to pay for your administration. It, it's, it's very costly to do the initial cost. Um, and there's a great deal of paperwork. So before every flight, you have to do uh, what we call an operational assessment, which is basically a risk assessment. Uh, my one is approaching 40 pages, you know, where we have to inform local authorities and, you know, this is for a simple roof inspection. So there are some disadvantages to it, but uh, that is what PFTO is. Uh, no Fly Zones, uh, this is very simply a website that we use, or I use, noflydrones.co.uk, which will then show particular flight paths where it's deemed as a danger area where you need to be aware of. Now this is the third party, meaning it's not an official, what it does, it gathers data from various parties. Um, it's more of to show you where, um, where there are some dangers. That big red path there, I believe it's the military fly zone, um, going down from north to south. Uh, obviously the purple are the prohibited zones, um, tends to be runways uh, and airports. That purple one sort of just above Hereford is going to be Shobden. Uh, shop an aerodrome, which I actually called yesterday because uh, I had a job that's doing their airspace and they were very accommodating. Um, and some of the restricted air space, uh, areas, the orange, um, they tend to be uh, like nuclear sites and prisons and things like that. So, again, a fantastic piece of kit to make sure that you're flying safely, um, but you use it with other factors. You don't just rely on it as gospel. Uh, the Drone and Model Reg Aircraft Registration Act came into effect on the 5th of November 2019. Uh, what does it mean? It basically means that if you have a drone over heavier than 250 grams, you have to register yourself as an operator. Now this means uh, if you're just flying it for funsies or in fact that you want to do it for a commercial venture. Um, you basically go onto the Civil Aviation Authority website, you register, you pay a whopping £9 annual fee and then there is an online educational assessment. It's basically a 20 question um, uh, multi-choice questions that you have to renew every three years and then from that you need to put your operational by law it, you have to put your operational id which is issued to you on your drone uh, the whole purpose of this was to garner a bit of um, accountability that if a drone was to fly away or land in a prison or land in a school then you can trace the drone to to who it is Cap 1789, um, again, as I said, the PFCO is coming to an end um, as of December of this year. Uh, what that means is no longer will you have PFCO. Um, no one, there'll be no two categories. It won't just be people with PFCO and people who don't have PFCO. Um, they'll all be falling into these different categories. Again, this is a huge section and a course all to itself, um, but just please be aware that things are changing if you were looking to do PFCO. If you are looking to do PFCO before December, that's absolutely fine because you can do it and it'll be grandfathered over to this um, new system. So you can do it beforehand, but just something to be aware of. Insurance. If you had a drone and it flew away, um, if as a recreational user, there are insurance companies out there. Um, they're quite difficult to get hold of in the sense of trying to get that insurance. Um, when I first started, no one would touch me with Denfoot barge pole, uh, purely because they would think, well, it's a drone, it's gonna fly away and you're just gonna be claiming. Um, so as recreational users, it can be a little bit more difficult, but cover drone is the one that I use for commercial, um, but they are doing recreational now as well. So there are a couple of organizations there. As commercial, it's a lot easier. The three main ones are moon rock, flock, and cover drone. They tend to be the go-to ones. Uh, flock, obviously, um, flock covers, uh, per flight insurance now as well. So if you were to do a commercial job, you don't have to pay an annual 
insurance fee. Um, you could just simply say that I've got this job next Thursday. Can I get insurance for that day? And I'll do that. It's very, very handy. So uh, just a summary, the CAA are the governing body that manages airspace and lays down the rules for all drone operators, which is that drone code as well. Um, ensure that you're conscientious and no-fly zones by using noflydrones.com, so always handy to keep an eye on it. And the rules are changing, so watch this space. And lastly, the future of drones. Um, things are changing, things are getting cheaper, things are getting smaller. Um, it's the technology is progressing very very quickly and it's an exciting time to be part of drones the difficulty that we are having is introducing or keeping up with the certain rules and regulations out there uh, like i said about the spraying where it, it's really struggling uh, to keep up the uk laws are um, we've got all sorts of interesting the, the the top photo there that's a large v drone um, that's actually a Facebook drone that goes up to 90,000 feet and projects Wi-Fi down third world countries. Um, the one with the whale uh, is actually a snot drone. <laughs> it's a modified drone where it's able to obtain um, data from breaching whales and return to scientists. You know, and then of course we have the infamous Amazon Prime Air, so the Amazon delivery drones. Um, how are these going to be implemented? I don't know, but it's a very exciting time to, to see. And then questions, but uh, yeah. And that's me. Um, I, I come with beard now, that's a slightly old photo. Um, but uh, any questions, please get in touch. I'm happy to help any way I can. Um, and yes, and that's it. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, Seamus, I'm not sure if you're still there. <laughs> yeah, I am. Um, I don't know if you click on your questions and answers. Um, you have got a few questions that have been posted for you. Yeah, no problem at all. Uh, let me just find, there we go. Um, okay, so first one from Robert Evans. Uh, does the Phantom 4 have thermal imaging cameras? No. So the Phantom 4 comes in various uh, degrees, um, all the way down from it, the advanced, which is actually the lower end, all the way up to the Phantom 4 Pro Plus. Um, the only drawback of having that Phantom 4 is they, are, they do not have an interchangeable camera. It only has the one camera and that's it. Um, it's a very good camera, mind, but it does not have the thermal imaging. You might find somewhere uh, a YouTube video where someone has uh, butchered it and managed to attach a thermal camera, but I wouldn't recommend it. So the only uh, sort of drone that you're able to pick up sort of off the shelf, as it were, is the Mavic Pro 2 Enterprise Tool, which uh, comes with a thermal camera. Um, okay, uh, hope that answers. Alad, um, I've just bought a DJI Enterprise drone, never had a drone before. What do I need to be legal flight? Do I need to register my drone or have a license? If so, where do I get it? I will only use it on my own land at home. Okay, Alad, so yeah, first thing you need to do is uh, go onto the Civil Aviation Authority website and then you register as an operator. All drone owners, as long as that drone is, it's an enterprise drone, so it's going to be over that 250 gram mark. Um, so, as you Normally I'd show uh, what 250 grams relates to in drone world, but it's, it's quite tricky. Um, so yeah, do I need to register my drone? So yeah, you need to register as an operator on there. Uh, you do that questionnaire, it's a very simple questionnaire. It's, it's, it's very basic stuff. Um, happy to help where I can with that. Um, Nine pounds and then you're good to go with that. Now, if you are looking just to fly your drone over your land at home, um, get some, you know, use it, whether it be, have a look at your cattle, sorry, I'm. I'm just generalizing, Alan, sorry, so forgive me if, if you're not a farmer or landowner, um, but if you are to do something like that, that's absolutely fine. You do not need to have a license or permission from the Civil Aviation Authority, as, as like I do, like PFCO I was talking about. Um, you'll, yeah, so no, just do the initial CAA registration online, but you don't need to do the PFCO if you just want to fly it over your own land. Um, can you attach a speaker to a Phantom 4? Uh, no, you can't, unfortunately. Um, again, the Phantoms are great drones, but they're very self-contained, uh, as it were. So it's very much pop out the box and off it goes. If you're looking to attach a speaker, then I suggest the Enterprise uh, Jewel. Again, it's another one with the speaker attachment, that one where you can control the sheep. That's from Robert Evans, by the way. And do, 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 uh, and Gwen Davis, thank you very much. Uh, um, being done on the use of drones for keeping birds off crops. Is it permitted and effective? Uh, very interesting. I haven't uh, actually seen any particular research. Um, I can only tell you from my experience as far as using um, 
and how birds react to drones. Um, as I said, we do a lot of roof inspection work. Uh, a lot of it's on the coast. Um, only a few weeks ago, I was in Aberystwyth. And birds do tend to be attracted, or certainly the birds that I was doing, seagulls tend to be attracted to the drones more than anything. Um, it, became, it, it sort of started off very funny and then became <laughs> infuriating, uh, where I had to actually sit in the van and wait for a certain time for those of the birds to calm down. Um, there have been um, some case stories of where attaching uh, um, high-vis stickers to the drone, so just um, having that reflective surface does repel. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't test it then, uh, but I do hear that, that, you know, that that does work in some cases. Um, another thing you obviously need to be very aware of is the legalities of um, flying or endangering birds. Um, I'm afraid if your drone went into a bird, uh, well, it would be pretty, pretty grim to be honest, <laughs> if anything. Um, but you need to be very careful and you bring your drone down. So you might be at risk then of causing damage. So you might want to be very, very careful with that. Um, but yeah, I'm afraid it's, for me personally, I haven't seen anything as far as a sort of consistent um, deterrent to birds off crops. Uh, but in my experience, I'm afraid it's been quite the other where birds have been attracted to drones. Um, I also did some work in Raider, and if any of you know what Raider's like, um, obviously it's the red kite center of Europe or something. And um, we have to be very, very wary of flying in that area. Um, and the, the kites took a very a liking to it, where we had to bring the drone down again and move to different areas. So uh, yeah, in my experience, they've actually been attracted to them rather than being deterred. Thanks, Robert, appreciate it. Uh, I think that's it, I think. Uh, yes, yeah, that's all in the list. Uh, but again, my details are up there, so please um, feel free to contact me. Uh, the Global Drone Training link at the bottom is where, uh, if you were interested in going down a commercial route, then that's, that's the kind of guys. But if you come speak to me first, then we can discuss something. But yeah, that's it.